Thank you so much. I'm Sherry McCoss of Overeater, and I weigh measure three meals a day off the gray sheet. I don't eat in between no matter what. It's the most important thing in my life. And my last bite was February 17th, 1996. And I also don't know how that became the last day I binged, but my story is like a torturous relapse story. Um, I related to both shares. Thank you so much. Um, I came into the rooms at 21, which is 39 years ago, because I'm 60. And I had binged my way through college, binged my way through Europe, a semester abroad, and um, went to Weight Watchers thinking that would be the answer. And it seemed to be in the beginning because there was healthy foods and dietetic products, and they told us how to make stuff in blenders. And I was like all in, you know, because I loved, the only thing I loved more than food was dietetic food. So you can eat a lot of it and not gain weight. So I was like chained to the blender, getting the treats, doing all that. The only problem was you were supposed to have one treat and you're supposed to substitute X amount of protein or whatever. And I was having like enough treats for a week. And I remember going to my, I was going to Weight Watchers every day. They said, come once a week. I was going every day because there was a hole in my soul. And I thought if I had more meetings, I would get it better. Anyway, I was like crying at my last Weight Watchers meeting because I had seven of those things that you're supposed to have one of and the, the instructor didn't know what to do with me. And I remember hearing about OA and I binged to my first meeting, of course, because I was never going to eat again. It was on 57th Street and 9th Avenue. And I never heard people talk about food the way they did. I was at home. I never left. I mean, I've relapsed many times, but I never left. There was a guy out of prison. There were, other, and there were every, Everybody was talking about how they ate until they passed out, ate until their skirts didn't fit, ate until... You know, they just mess things up. There were, I remember in college, there was like food on my term papers. Everything was late because I was always in the food. And uh, I stopped living. I stopped dating. I stopped having interests because my only interest was food. That was it. Um, So anyway, I never left the room. So it wasn't gray sheet quite. It was like gray sheet with exception back then. So I got a sponsor. She was thin. I worshiped thin people. I thought if you were thin, you had no problems. And I turned over my food for a year and they, they said, go to AA meetings if you can't find a OA meeting. So I went to AA as well because everything was in my neighborhood in Midtown where I worked. And I thought this was like, great, you know, I'm measuring my food, I'm enjoying my food, I'm going to meetings, I'm relating to people, I'm calling people. And I lost all the weight, I lost the 50 pounds. And unfortunately, nothing else changed or I didn't want to change. I heard about the steps and this and that, but I didn't want to change. And I had all these other issues underlying the food. I had anorexia with money. I came from poverty mentality, parents, middle class, but they were from another country and everything was about save money, save money, don't spend money, living food is love. And, and so when I lost the weight, I didn't buy myself clothes. I didn't replace the food with anything else. I just put the food down and I had this huge emptiness. So I started eating and in no time I gained the 50 pounds back and I was just eating and eating and eating on every street corner in Manhattan on every, and I tried everything. I tried a big book group and no matter what I did, I would I'd feel better when I did a four step. I'd feel better when I did service, but I still wanted the food. And there were some groups that said, Oh, just eat whatever you want. Just do the steps. And that per- proved to be a false God because In AA, they don't say drink wine and do the steps. It's like you have to put the substance down because as long as I can get comfort from food, I'm not going to go to God. So I would have a year of absence and I would eat. I'd have 90 days of absence that eat. Day one, day one, day one. And it got harder and harder. Like I used to think, oh, I'll just snap my fingers and I'll be absent again. I'll eat this weekend. I'll be absent tomorrow. But it didn't work like that. I couldn't predict when I would get absent again. And... So anyway, I'd heard about gray sheet and it was like the real gray sheet and I didn't want to do it at all. Uh, I thought I'm not measuring in public. I'm not measuring on dates. I'm not measuring in business. And I also had this job with an expense account where you can eat, you know, the fanciest restaurants, but I wasn't eating like a normal person there. I was eating the stuff in the basket and I would binge and then go home and really binge because I didn't want to eat with people when I was eating. I wanted to eat alone. I wanted bags and boxes. I didn't want to be a lady at a restaurant. Um, so my sponsor said, okay, no more restaurants. And I thought I was going to lose my job. I said, are you crazy? This is what I you know, have to do for work. And it turned out it was all bogus because when I stopped going to restaurants and went to AA meetings instead and brought my lunch to work, nobody complained. 
nobody, nobody in my industry said, oh, how come we can't meet for lunch? They were happy to talk it to me on the phone, at their desk, at their office. It was all, I was, you know, concocting the story that I had to go to these events and luncheons, but I didn't. So my sponsor and I worked out that I would eat at my desk and then go to whatever, wherever, and just have coffee or just have, you know, water. So I did that and my performance actually improved because I wasn't so focused on the food. Anyway, I wish I could say that was the end of it. So I did two years of abstinence with exception. I just didn't measure on dates. And then I met my husband and he was a big restaurant. He's a big restaurant person. So my exceptions became more frequent. Instead of once a week, it was seven times a week. And he had come from a large family. So it was weddings, bar mitzvahs. And I would go in with good intentions. And before I knew it, I was binging, binging in the bathroom telling him to take me to set. We go to a fancy rest, fancy wedding. And then I'd say, okay, let's go to 7-Eleven because I've got to finish the binge. And he didn't know what was going on. But that's the kind of eater I am. I'm not looking for the Plaza Hotel. I want to eat at Dwayne Reed. I want bags. I want three for a dollar, you know, bags of stuff. So I saw that the road was getting really dark and narrow, you know, like there was no way out. I was... I couldn't do regular OA because I used abused every exception privilege. And I didn't want to do gray sheet because it was really like shutting, slamming the door on my disease. And my husband didn't want me to do gray sheet. He didn't want me to bring the scale to a restaurant. But I saw the writing on the wall and it was like, whatever happened that day, February 17th, um, I, I remember like having this period of months where I would just bring gray sheet food to work, to eat. And then on the way to an AA meeting, literally where I was going to eat the lunch, I changed my mind and said, no, I think I'm going to do regular OA and throw out my salad and replace it with a carb. And there are, you know, just back and forth. Like one day I'm in gray sheet, one day I'm in OA. I'm calling different sponsors. I'm like juggling everything like a circus, you know? And I remember calling this woman. I was about to do that same thing again. And she said, just give it up. She said, I've seen you relapse for years, just surrender. And I did that day. I don't know why. But I did. And there was no phone bridge. So I went to AA sometimes twice a day. I lived in New Jersey. So I went to meetings in New Jersey, went to meetings in the city. And I started to make phone calls like my life depend on it. It wasn't three a day. It was like 30 a day. If I got machines, I just kept calling. I didn't care. The same, um, you know, like I tell my sponsees, binge on phone calls. The same energy that goes into binging on food, you can spend on phone, you know, you can apply to phone calls. So I would just call people. Maybe I got three out of 30. I don't know. It didn't matter. And, you know, I know people get resentments. People don't call me back. I didn't care if you called me back. I just knew I had to call you. I knew I didn't want to die from eating anymore. And it was an emotional death. It wasn't the weight gain. This time, my last relapse, I didn't gain that much weight because I was going to the gym and I was using sweeteners to keep the weight low. And that was another addiction I had to put down because my last, my last relapse started with sweeteners, I would have equal and gum and, and it created such a craving for sugar that I ended up binging on sugar after having equal. So everything had to go down right at once. Um, except I had black coffee in the beginning, but even now I don't have coffee. I've been at coffee. So, so what, so I knew I had to change. There was no more putting down the food and not changing. Those days were over. I had to put down the food and get right into the big book. And I met, I met a woman at an AA meeting and she said, your real problem is selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. The food has been covering it up. And, you know, she had me read the first 63 pages of the big book, which is the first three steps. And I highlighted the words recover and recovery. And then right away we were doing the first three steps. You know, I can't, he can't, I'm going to let him. And then, you know, the third step is a decision, but if it's not followed by action, it's useless. So right away that next day I was doing my four step, all my resentments, Everybody ever resented, why, what it affected, my part. Now, I thought I didn't have a part in a lot of, but you know, my part could be that I don't accept, like my mother was very negligent and I have scoliosis. She wouldn't take me to doctors and I had surgery later on in life and I hated my mother. I had so much resentment against her and my father was horrible. And Five minutes. Thank you. And so my part was lack of acceptance. I couldn't accept that God gave me these parents. I couldn't accept X, Y, and Z. And so I just went through every person in my life and how I couldn't accept them for whatever reason. And my fears, did a fear inventory, sex inventory. And in all my relationships with men, it was always, what can I get? Oh, your apartment is next to my office. Great. I'll move in. You know, it's because whatever was like good for me, whatever's convenient for me, whatever was. 
And so, and then I did my amends and, and I've been living in 10, 11, 12 ever since. And I take people through the steps and I have a big book step study meeting every Sunday at 8 a.m. where we take you through the steps as a group, but you can, I could do it individually. And I'm so lazy and selfish, like somebody else said. It's like, I never want to do it, but I'm always happy when I do it and help you. But I never want to. Like even when Grania, and thank you for taking me through the Zoom process. When she called me up and said Zoom, I was like, oh, I don't want to learn anything new. I don't want to be bothered. But it was such a blessing because, you know, with the virus and everything, my husband said to me, you can't go to meetings anymore. You can't go to the gym anymore. And I have to say, a lot of my recovery and absence is contingent on the gym and AA meetings. I go to AA every single day. I don't know what it is. It just lifts me up. I hear these stories that are just, I mean, you know, the great sheet is great, but I, I need to hear car crashes, death, rehab. Like I hear like really, because I'm in so much like, I have such a thick skull that I need to hear like crazy stuff for it to penetrate. So um, I didn't go to AA today and I'm like, I was beside myself. I couldn't go to the gym today. So I exercised at home. I did call some people and, but it was really hard. And I thought, how am I going to get through this? And I have 24 years and it just feels like I'm a newcomer. I mean, that's the scary part that you have 24 years, but it doesn't matter because what are you doing today? It doesn't matter what I did yesterday or 20 years ago. What am I doing today for my recovery? So I prayed to help somebody today. I prayed obviously to not eat and to get busy with work and exercise and whatever, but my life is over if I eat. I mean, it's just over because I have a daughter, I have a husband, I have a job, I have a house, I have a car. It's like all these things that you just like assume are going to stay if you pick up, they're not, they're not going to stay. I'm going to lose everything. And part of me really just wanted to go to the AA meeting in spite of the virus and say, I'll take my chances or I'll stand six feet away or whatever. But um, it just forced me to pray more, forced me to try this new technology, connect with more gray sheeters. But, you know, one thing I've learned by going to AA meetings is never underestimate this disease. I've seen people with 25 years, 30 years go out. And a lot of times they go out when things are good. You know, people assume, oh, you're going to go out. I had cancer 15 years ago that I'm in remission from. When you have like a tragedy or difficulty, sometimes you brace yourself and you're strong. It's when good things are happening, you get complacent, you get, you forget. You know, they say we have a disease of amnesia. So I have to be very clear that I am a drunk with food. Like that is, you know, thank you. Um, and sometimes I find myself sleeping or staying in bed later, whatever it is to make, you know, if the day is too long. Um, I have joined a, a Bible group. It's a Bible for food group, which has been very helpful because reading the Bible, which I thought, how's that going to help me? It just shows like the willfulness, you know, the, the original sin, you know, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed, you know, that was, that's me. It's like, I'm always like, I was told to do this. And of course I didn't listen, you know, and so many times I was told, don't eat no matter what, don't. And I thought, they don't know what they're talking about. I know I have to eat. I, you know, this problem is so great. I must eat, you know, like I always thought I knew better, better than my sponsors, better than, you know, even today, it's hard for me to believe, oh, if I don't eat, my life is going to get better or, or not get worse. It's like, it just feels like a non sequitur. What does not eating have to do with like the coronavirus? But if I eat, I'm not finding the wipes. I'm not going to the stores to, you know, prepare. I'm like in la la land, you know, I'm just chasing the food and I will disregard all precautionary measures and put my life in danger. So not eating has to be the bedrock, you know, and from there I can find God and from there I can do service and help others. But if I pick up the food, I, I, I'm bowing to this false God. And food is not going to do it. It's just it's not going to answer any of my problems or fix anything. So anyway, I hope I've helped someone and um, no matter what.